Okay, guys, let's make a starter. So, welcome to our very modern lecture theatre. Um, I've got Mel in the case of moving us as we speak. It's me going out and making a phone call. Um, today's lecture is going to be mostly PowerPoint slides, so it's not going to be too much of an issue being here. Um, subsequent lectures are going to be extensive writing on the whiteboard, um, and that doesn't work here. Um, additionally, our lecture tomorrow was scheduled over in what is a dry lab, which benches up here in stools, um, and an hour worth of theory lecture doesn't really work in a dry lab, so I've moved that already. Our lecture tomorrow will be in 133, so 15133, um, and that's just the big lecture theatre in the middle of engineering there. Everyone should have had lunch. Um, I will send out an email as soon as I leave this class with wherever this is going to be next week and confirm the whole timetable. Uh, my apologies for it being shifted around. I couldn't get access to this room yesterday and obviously can't see in this room, so I couldn't work out whether it was going to work or not. Um, but the other room we, we realised was going to not work very quickly. So the new time tabling system still has some kinks that we're trying to uh, work out of it. Now, um, so, welcome to ME2525. This is uh, probably your first real design subject. Uh, this subject is the fundamentals of design. Um, and those fundamentals are pretty much the, the types of techniques that you're going to be applying for the rest of your careers. All right, so what you learn in this subject um, will get some bells and whistles added to it in later years. So you'll do more complex geometry, you might do more complex loading, you might have you know, more complex design process and other systems you have to work with. But the fundamentals that you learn here are the fundamentals that you apply forever, basically. All right, so um, please take this subject very seriously um, because if you uh, miss parts of it, then you'll just have to relearn them later anyway. Um, a real defining characteristic of this subject is that you'll use these over and over and over and over again. So there'll be a lot of practice. Uh, I was talking to one of the fourth years yesterday, talking about this subject, and he was recalling that um, it was a really hard subject when he was here, um, and now it's all second nature. Um, and it's just, you know, what you do in the general business of engineering. So it's a challenging subject. It's challenging theoretically. Um, hopefully I've got enough tutorials and tools and practice and things for you guys to go through. Um, and we'll get you to a point where you can really be designing real machine components, which is the fun of this course. Um, as I said in my email, uh, attendance is one of the biggest characteristics of passing in this subject. Or more correctly, if you don't come, I can almost guarantee you'll fail. All right, so, you know, miss a lecture or whatever, I record them, so that's, that's not, not a problem. But the, the actual lectures will do a lot of, like, lectorial things where you guys do exercises in the class immediately after I give you the theory and, and we'll interact that way. And that's the best way for you guys to actually absorb the material and you don't capture a lot of that if you're just watching back a lecture video. So it's good to catch up, but it's not a substitute for actually coming to class. Um, and the tutorials are even more important than the lectures, so make sure you can make those tutorial classes. All right, you've got the subject outline on LearnJCU. I won't go through it in too much detail. You guys should be pretty familiar with subject outlines these days. This is basically our contract. Our contract between me and you telling you what I'm going to provide you in this subject. Okay? Um, the main thing will be we have tutorial assignments. So 15% of your assessment is basically you submitting the weekly tutorial task, which will be, generally speaking, when's that tutorial? 9 a.m. on Mondays. So I'll probably normally give you till 5 p.m. that day to submit the tutorial work, but it, you should do it in the class time. It's far better if you do it in the class time when I'm there and I can actually help you through it, uh, because as I say, there's some complex sort of things that you need to get through. Uh, workshops, there's gonna be two workshops. Uh, they're worth 5% each, and basically the first one's gonna be you guys go out and find a shark, all right? That's you pull some machine apart or look under your trailer or look under your car and measure, take measurements of your drive shaft, take measurements of you know, whatever shafts you want to find, crankshafts or whatever, in a bicycle or a motorbike or something like that. Right? You guys need to go find a real machine, take measurements of a real shaft and estimate what the forces are and then we'll do a full stress analysis and, and audit on that shaft. Okay? So you will see real things. 
um, and that machine component you can start looking for now. All right. So keep your eyes open. In a couple of weeks, I'll give you the exact specifics of you know what that that piece of assessment is. Um, but you can you can be looking now if if you you know if you go and look um, under your car, under your trailer, at your bike, anything like that. Start to think about what sort of shafts. Um, are available to you in your life that you could analyse. The second one, um, I haven't finalised yet, but I think I'm going to do another weld. So it'll be a weld analysis. So again, go out in your life, find yourself a weld that has, in that case, cyclic forces, and we'll talk about that. But um, So you don't need to do that yet, but just keep your eyes open if, if there's some sort of a weld. And, and normally a good one is, is like a tow ball. So if you've got a you know a tow bar on your on your car, there's lots of good welds that are under fatigue loading on that. Um, so keep an eye out if your parents have that, or you have that, or friends or something like that. Just just kind of clock welds as you're walking around, and, and maybe take a photo and just think about what you want to analyse in that. But that will come up in the second half of the semester. Okay. Uh, quizzes we have three. They are five percent each, um, and then the final exam is sixty percent. Um, generally speaking, if you do poorly on the quizzes, the final exam is going to be difficult, so you need to study all the way along with this subject. Largely because what I've been talking about, what you do this week, we'll use next week and add complexity to it. And what you do that week, we'll use the following week and add complexity to it. Everything builds. There is nothing that we just leave and walk away from. Alright, so everything that you've learned in CS 2001, I'm going to be revising in the next two or three weeks, uh, and then we're going to use all of that and move on. Alright, so make sure you're studying ongoingly because if you don't do it early, it'll be difficult late. Alright, and then we've got subject learning outcomes. So I suppose I'll go through those and then, and then we'll get into the actual class. First one, recognise and employ the fundamental scientific principles of mechanical design, being stress, strain, material properties, failure theories, fatigue phenomena, fracture mechanics. So we're talking about, so CS2001, you guys have done stress, strain, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, have you? I think Toe went into a little bit on failure theories. Um, he said that he did. Um, that class isn't really supposed to go there, but that's okay. We're going to do that properly, and you're going to basically be designing things so that they don't fail. Um, and so to do that, we calculate the forces, we calculate the stresses, we relate the stress to some sort of criteria that indicates this amount of stress will break, this amount of stress won't, and then we'll work out whether something's going to last forever or not. All right, two. Apply analysis theories in the solution of practical design problems, addressing the function, design, and uh, capacity of actual machine components, including prediction of their life and failure. So the first half of this subject is going to be all fundamentals. Um, and so we're going to do sort of shaft design, but really learn about stress and strain and, and how we analyse failure based on simple shafts. The second half of this subject, we're going to do welds, we're going to do gears, we're going to do bolts, and we're going to do some more real machine components that aren't just simple shafts. Okay? And the idea is that you see enough of those different machine components that when you, you know, see one following, um, following this class that I haven't taught you how to analyse, you'll have the fundamental skills to be, oh, all right, well that's kind of like a shaft and it's kind of like a bolt and I'll probably use this process, um, I just need to find some equations that relate to that particular geometry or component. Um, and the textbook for this subject is really, really good. Um, it's got a lot more than what I'll teach you as well. Um, and everyone in subsequent years basically still uses that in every single design practice that they go through. Right? I still use that design textbook. So um, out of any textbook you buy at university, that one's, a, that one's a good one. That one's one you buy and you hold and look after. Um, if the $120, $110, whatever price tags are a bit rich for you, then uh, there's an online version as well that's like $55. Um, and I'll put a link to that on, I think, this and also online on LearnJCU. So um, if you like online versions, it's cheaper. Um, otherwise, get the, get the hard copy because every single tutorial we do will reference that textbook. Um, and as I say, there's lots of different machine components that I won't be covering in this class that are in that textbook that will give you a basis for everything else you need to do forever, basically. All right. Practice systematic approaches to mechanical design and analysis procedures. So, we will go through a stepped procedure to analyse all of the different things that we do. Um, we will lay it out in writing, and I think there's one about that as well, but the staged procedure is general to literally everything you ever analyse. All right, And that systematic process, the same way as in EG1000, uh, I talked about the five-stage design process, that's the bigger picture. Within that, you have systematic 
analysis procedures that we'll talk about in this subject. Okay, so um, hopefully I explained to you the reason why we have procedures rather than just you know doing things and hoping for the best. It makes it much easier to attain sort of solutions to open-ended problems. Um, so we'll learn analysis versions of those in this subject. Implement standards and, uh, in the design of machine components, blah, blah, blah. So AS standards are very, very important. Um, and one thing that I'll really emphasise in this subject, and you'll get it emphasised by Rory and everyone else in subsequent subjects, is there are lots of different ways you analyse things. All right? And an engineer is not someone who does one equation and says, sweet, not going to break, we're done. All right? What you're going to learn in this subject is hand calculations. Uh, you're also going to get exposed to AS standards, which complement that. So you do a hand calculation, and then you apply an AS standard. An AS standard is just a generalised version of a hand calculation. All right, something that people do really frequently, and so it saves you time having to do the individual calculation. So you can do an AS standard, and oftentimes um, a lot of the laws and legislation are related to you satisfying standards as well. So we need to know standards. I'm going to introduce you to them. And then in later subjects like EG3001, you're going to learn finite elements. That's a different analysis. Now, finite elements can be great or garbage, depending on what you put into them. And all they're doing is complex versions of what you're learning in the subject. So oftentimes, when you're doing real design, you'll do a finite element model. You'll do a back of the envelope hand calculation, look like what you learn here. You'll apply an Australian standard. You might do some experiments. And by the time you've got about four or five points of data, and all of them say it's not going to break, that's when you're happy it's not going to break. Under no circumstance should you use one analysis technique for engineering, almost ever. All right, so you're going to learn a couple in this subject, and then you're going to learn the rest of them later. All right, and last one is produce analysis briefs, design sketches and assembly and detailed drawings uh, to com communicate design. So obviously everything we do we're going to write down. Uh, and, and I'm going to give you some procedures and, and very uh, defined ways that you're going to write down stuff in this subject, and hopefully you can follow that in the future as well. All right, any questions on the learning outcomes? No? Pretty simple. Five, five learning outcomes. Make sure you're familiar with them, and make sure when you, you know, at the end of each week when you're doing some study or something like that, it'll be useful to reflect on what you learnt that week, look at the subject learning outcomes and see which ones they align with, and that starts to track your own uh, learning. All right, I think that's everything I need to go through in this. Um, obviously, you need 50% to pass. You need 40% of the invigilated. Same sort of stuff that we always have in, in subjects. Okay, so um, make sure you achieve that. All right, so I guess for the rest of this first hour, we're going to have a bit of a discussion. We're going to talk about the design process. You've learned the five-stage design process in EG1000. I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit. And we're going to discuss some of the different aspects of that. And one of the aspects of that is analysis. And that's what we're going to focus on largely in this subject. But this is going to give you sort of some of the context of where that fits in a, in a larger design. And the really fun thing and the really scary thing about design uh, is uncertainty. So up till now, Almost, uh, maybe aside from some of the design things you did in EG1000 and maybe a couple of other subjects, up till now, most of the time you've had one solution that you're aiming for. All right? One place that you're trying to get. That is now no longer the case. All right? We've got, well, these three major areas, so properties, so strength of the material, what material you choose, um, what's its fatigue life, what's its you know, ultimate strength, that sort of thing. Geometry, so what is the shape of the item? It could be bigger, ergo it would be stronger, it could be smaller and weaker. Um, loading, what sort of forces are on it? And those three things are kind of variable. So you can set two of them and then the, calculate the other one, or you can you know, calculate a couple of them with one set. It's a moving game. So there's no right answer, there's just a solution that has properties, geometry and loading, and it doesn't fail. All right, and that's a solution. Now, there's other considerations because if you make it huge, obviously there's lots of material there. It's going to be very costly, and so there's there's all these other parameters that kind of feed into that. But there's uncertainty. We don't have any single solution, and so it's really open-ended. It's really creative. You can be creative to solve these problems, but uh, it can be a little bit scary if you don't have these systems in place. And so that's what we're going to teach you. All right, and as I've been saying. Uh, fundamentally, 
mechanical engineers are interested with making sure stuff doesn't break. All right? You can make stuff, you can do its job, but if it fails, then someone has to replace it, or you get sued. Yeah. Fundamentally, hopefully, you know, someone doesn't get hurt, but that's the worst case scenario of that. So engineers, the reason that we're engineers and not just inventors or tradesmen building stuff just for fun, is that they need engineers to make sure stuff's going to last and fundamentally, in the end, be signing off and saying this is going to last and not break and not hurt someone. All, right? All you are is your signature once you're actually you know, a, a, a professional engineer and you've got that accreditation. Okay? And that signature basically says it's not going to fail. And there's a few different ways that things fail. Technical failure, as in the engineer screwed up. There's operational failure, as in the uh, operator screwed up. Um, and then there's unpredictable failure, as in nature, kind of screwed up. Um, you know, that's your cyclones, your earthquakes, your, you know, that kind of that kind of stuff. Um, these are the major things that will cause something to fail. All right, I talked to most of you about the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Does anyone remember what actually happened? Anyone? Yeah. No. So they were drilling for oil. They found oil. They actually found gas as well. And something happened and the gas bubbled up and went to the surface. Now there was a few things that happened that actually caused this. So I'm talking about this again in relation to our technical, operational and unpredictable failure. Alright? So they hit a bump, which is a big, you know, bit of gas while while they're drilling for oil. Um, and that gas comes flying up because basically as you're drilling you're trying to suck, you know, it's it's a you know a bore, so your the oil comes up, and once the oil comes up, you yeah we struck oil, excellent. We'll you know go and start pumping it out. So if it hits gas, that gas is going to rush up the open pipe, all right? And that's really bad. You don't want that happening because gas is extremely explosive. And so you've got fail safes that detect that and cut it off, all right? And so that's fail safes down that actually at the drill head oftentimes they'll have fail safes to shut that off and then they'll have more fail safes on, on the actual drilling platform that should catch that and all of these fail safes fail and then the, the gas actually made it to the surface all right so fail safes fail what are we looking at whoops technical, technical fail yeah no one no one screwed it up other than the engineer that made them um, Aside from the fact that later on there was speculation that one of the consoles that ran these things um, ran on batteries and that the batteries hadn't been changed, at which point we're looking at operation failure. All right, and so this this gas gets to the surface, and I, it, you know, obviously bad. Hopefully, no one's having a cigarette or something at the time. But fundamentally, gas unto itself not a big problem unless you have a spark. Unfortunately, right there next to where the where the drill basically was was put through the platform were all the intakes for the generators, the air intakes, and so they just sucked this straight through the the generators. And anyone that knows you, you spray some fuel or start your basket or something on an intake, um, spun up and they all exploded. All right. So once again, we're sort of talking about technical failure in so much as you've got these generators intaking right where you could get gas should all those fail safes fail um, and then bang no good now that's on fire it's on the surface the reason it sunk and that there was the massive oil spill was because they came and had all these fire trucks and they filled up the platform trying to put the fire out with water and they're trying to put the fire out because they've lost 11 people and they're hoping that they haven't lost 11 people that they can get in there and, and save them if they're, if they're you know, in an area that they can't get out but not incinerated, I guess. Um, so they're there putting all the, all the fire out, uh, flood the platform because it's a floating platform, down it sinks, big steel pipe, 2Ks, 3Ks where the steel pipe gets bent over and it snaps, snaps, snaps and snaps off at the bottom and now you've got all of that oil leaking out and that's what actually happened, that was the disaster. And if you think about two or three k's down, it might have even been deeper than that. Um, we don't have any gear. There, no one's invented anything to actually cap a well that deep down. Right? There's, there's actually no, they had to invent it. And that's why it took months and months, because they're inventing robots to go down and do these things. Because no one had actually ever built it, because it had never been a problem before. All right, so that's, that's some very work on your feet, engineers, and they basically contacted almost every university in the US saying, have you got something to solve this problem? They had to ship these submarines in from the other side of the world just to go down and see what the problem actually was, and that took a couple of weeks. It was a complete catastrophe. 
So there was a lot of different factors all going on. You had technical failure, you had operational failure, unpredictable in so much as you hit gas and that's not really predictable, but most of the time they expect that, so that's not, not I guess, too unpredictable. Um, and all of those things came together to cause a massive disaster. So oftentimes you find more than one thing has to go wrong to cause something really bad. Tacoma Narrows. Uh, we're going to start. There we go. Is that working? Beautiful. You guys will have seen this one. What do you reckon that was? In terms of fire, was it unpredictable? Was it operator? Was it technical? Technical. Technical. So we've talked about this before, basically the wind whistling across it was causing vortexes off the back of the bridge, um, and then those excited a natural frequency. And so obviously whoever designed it hadn't recognised that natural frequency as being important in the design, um, and it was not good for the bridge. There's a car stereo at one point, that car. Um, let's fast forward to it ripping itself apart. What is that dude? You couldn't pay me enough money to run out on the bridge and save a dog doing that. Yeah. But anyway, you can see the, the extreme result of that, uh, I guess, technical failure. There we go. There's only so much bending that concrete and steel can deal with before it, it dies. All right, World Trade Center. Everyone's seen this one. I don't know if I've shown this video to anyone before, uh, aside from this class. Um, this is analysis of why the, the buildings actually came down. Right? What would you think that that collapse would be? Would that be technical? Would it be operator? Would it be unpredictable? Unpredictable, yeah. I mean, it's, you can't really predict an aeroplane flying into your building, aside from the fact that now every high-rise building is designed to deal with an aeroplane crashing into it. Um, the strange thing about design is that most of the design rules that we have are based on something breaking in the past. Right? So most of the standards, most of the design rules, most of the, the ways that we actually design are as a direct result of something breaking and either hurting people or costing heaps of money in the past. So all the fatigue stuff we talk about in this subject, um, I think it was de Havilland. They were flying around and their wings started falling off and no one really knew why. And now every aeroplane is designed with round windows rather than square windows because the square windows were causing cracks at the corners because of the fatigue, because of the stress concentration. And we'll talk about fatigue and stress concentration and all that in this subject. Uh, this World Trade Center is kind of unpredictable. You could call it operator failure in so much as you're technically not supposed to crash a plane into a building. Um, so that's operator. And these days, if you had this happen again to a new building, that would be classified probably as a technical failure because it's not unpredictable anymore. This happened, there's the potential that this might happen, therefore we designed to avoid it. For existing buildings, do they have to make changes to prevent things like that again? They haven't that I've seen. Okay. Um, now, the, the problem with this building was that um, it was obviously the tallest building in the world at the time. So they had to do some really uh, out there engineering to get it to that height. Um, and one of the things that they did was make it really light. And to make it really light, they had a central spine of the main load-bearing steelwork. And that central spine, because it's so localised, firstly it was light and made the building easier to get up that high, but as soon as you localise all that jet fuel right there in that centre, when you compromise the centre, central spine, you have no strength anywhere anymore. And that's why the whole thing came down, and both of them came down in exactly the same way, because the same thing happened. Um, and it's all the steel within the, within the actual concrete. Now this is finite element modelling and some smooth particle hydrodynamics modelling of them modelling that plane actually going into the building and where the jet fuel ended up. And you'll see in a second, so that's the finite element, so that's the plane coming in and what sort of damage will that plane do. One of the next simulations is they actually model all of the fuel in that wing and where that fuel goes and then where it ignites and, and work out what the heat is and what the localization of fuel and was the fuel still in the plane or did the fuel just spread everywhere to try and work out where that failure actually originated. 
And that's how they finally <coughs> worked out that it was, it was the, the melting of that steel, the compromising of the steel in that spine that caused it. Now every building subsequent has their structure far wider and fireproof to whatever the you know, temperature of, of burning jet fuel is. This is the fuel within the wing and how it comes out of the wing. So obviously they've hidden the plane. There's the plane going in and that's the steel structure and the main bits in the centre. And then it goes. So you can see, I, I, I brought this up partly to talk just about failure with you and the way that, that we now design. And, and when we actually design, you've got to think about all of the different ways things have failed in the past. So you, you're not designing in a vacuum. If you're designing a building now, you reference this. If you design a bridge, you always reference the comb and arrows and you deal with all your you know, natural frequencies and things. But also to point out that design isn't just about uh, creating products. It's not about doing something new. A lot of the time, what design will be is root cause analysis. What caused this failure? A lot of what you'd be doing in industry, if a big machine goes down and it's costing you a million bucks a day, Firstly, you fix it straight away, and secondly, you work out why it went down to try and avoid it so that on the next maintenance cycle, you might be able to improve something and take that away. So root cause, why does something fail? And all the things that we learn in this subject, all of these fundamental design skills, you use both for designing new product things and for the root cause analysis. So what are the forces? What are the stresses? What did they actually document initially in the analysis that they did and were there assumptions that were incorrect? And we'll talk a lot about writing down clear assumptions for every single thing that you analyse. So anyway, this is a very, very complex problem and this is now the, the fuel actually igniting and they can, they can even analyse where the peak temperature points are from these things based on the analysis they run. This was run on one of the biggest US super, I think it was it was Lawrence Livermore or Sandia, one of their, one of their supercomputers, and, and ran for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, but this is the sort of the big game FEA stuff that you can do, that you'll be learning the fundamentals of in 3001 next semester. Alright, so, that's su just some examples of failure, right? And that's the sorts of things that we're going to avoid. And you need to think about all of those different dimensions when you're designing. There's some more really interesting ones. So look up on Google the de Havilland Comet. So that's what I was talking about. Metal fatigue. Everything we do as mechanical engineers is based on metal fatigue. Um, and it's largely based on what they learned from the comet. So there was huge root cause analysis on those planes. They reconstructed them. They put whole planes in giant big water tanks and rate, move them up and down and up and down and up and down to actually fail and work out where they failed and that's how they worked out that it was fatigue and it was happening from the corners of the windows. Which is really interesting and there's lots of videos and things on that so if you care, go and have a look. That website there, engineeringfailures.org, has lots of the big ones. So Challenger Disaster, what happened there, um, lots of other ones like that. And it's worthwhile as engineers going through and being familiar with the big ones. Because the big ones have a tendency to have had a big impact on the way we practice as mechanical engineers. And you'll see a lot of it. So fatigue, for example, is in everything we do. And a lot of the really good research that was done on that was during the de Havilland Comet root cause analysis stuff. And there's lots of other founding principles of engineering that actually stem from disaster. So it's interesting and it's useful to, to be across it. So, you're there. That's us. Uh, has everyone seen this? It's in the back of your subject outline. I don't know if everyone else puts it still, but I still put it in the back of every subject outline. These are your streams. This is your uh, design stream. And immediately following, Rory has you for EG3001 and then ME3525. And then right at the end, Rong will have that last design subject. And generally speaking, that's a big Wilmar project. So you guys in a group, get handed a project, and you spend the whole semester solving it. All right. Um, so by the time you get through all of the things that we talk about, you'll get to that. And so we're dealing with fundamentals, FEA, you've designed some car, uh, and then you'll do a Wilmar project. So it's all part of that design stream, and hopefully it's nice and consistent for you guys, and you can see where the preceding bit relates to the, the future bit. Alright, so, design process. We're going to, um, I think, the next slide, we're going to design a bicycle. 
um, and we're going to talk about designing a bicycle at least. Uh, if you've got a handout sheet in front of you, that will kind of help us a little bit. This is the design process. You've got the five stage design process that we've talked about in EG1000. This is kind of a fleshed out version of that, right? So, what's the first thing we do in the five stage design process? Anyone remember? We define the problem. What is the problem? Yeah? So let's look at the fleshed out version. Problem definition or framing. Alright? And so all of those points actually help you to define the problem. What's the second step? If you were to design something, what would you need to do? Research? Yeah. Yeah, so you kind of kind of do research. What's everyone done before? What I was just talking about, root cause analysis, has anyone designed something and had it catastrophically go wrong and what are you going to do to avoid that? Research. And so we're talking in this framing of it, in conceptual design, a large part of conceptual design there is the research. The third part is your uh, coming up with multiple solutions. So that's the brainstorming phase, the, the ideation phase. And again, that sits under conceptual design. So in this sort of framing of the, the design process, you can see that the research and the conceptualization are, are pretty intimately linked. All right? And you would have seen that when you've actually applied it. So when you were doing research on pumps, that research, you were already thinking based on that about what sort of design alternatives you might go with as a result of the research. So you can see that they're kind of linked in terms of steps. Then this is kind of a a framing of what we talked about, preliminary design. So you take maybe one of those ideas that you have and start resolving it, start doing the analysis and so forth. And then detailed design, that's where you might build some prototypes and test them. So that's stage, I guess, four and five that we talked about. One that we didn't talk about in EG1000, but you did it anyway, is design communication. And in this context, that can be reports, it can be drawings, it can be lots of things, and we'll talk about that. But it's one thing to talk about it, it's another thing to um, actually use your brains. So let's, let's think about each of these steps in terms of designing a bicycle. Has everyone got a bicycle, ridden a bicycle, or at least seen a bicycle? Good, we're on board there. Alright, stage one. Problem definition. What's the function of our bicycle? Travel. Travel? Yep, so that's, that's a fundamental principle. Can we elaborate on that? What do we want to design? Does anyone here ride a bike? Yeah? What sort of bike you got? Not stolen, but I do ride a bike. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, maybe that comes in at least for bringing it up. Yeah. Um, all right, so what sort of bike was it before it got stolen? It was oh, obviously great. It's a mountain bike. Mountain bike, there we go. So, transport, but within a particular context, we have mountain bikes, we have road bikes, we have BMXs, we have trikes, we have those silly things that you sit down and sort of pedal up above your head in. There's lots of different types of bikes, so one of the first things we're going to do is, is define that. What do we want to do? Mountain bike? Let's talk about mountain bike. Great. Alright, motivation. Why are we designing a bike? This is defining the problem. Why are you thinking about a bike right now? Uh, yeah, because I told you to. <laughs> Fundamentally, yeah. What, what's your motivation? Someone's going to come to you and say, I want you to design a new mountain bike. Why? What's their motivation? Do they want to sell a million of them? Do they want to sell two of them? Are they a mountain <coughs> bike rider and they just want like a really trendy custom thing that they can't buy off the shelf? What is their motivation for this? And I suppose related to that, is there a market for that? Because it's, it's kind of right in your ballpark to work that out as well. Because if you come to them with a $20,000 bike that's the best thing since sliced bread and they wanted to sell them for 40 bucks down at the, you know, wherever, that's not, you know, that's not going to get you paid. That's, that's not going to get you a good reputation as an engineer. You need to get that upfront straight away. Uh, resources, what have you got at your disposal? What do they want you to have at your disposal? Where might we get this manufactured? China. China? Yeah, fair chance. Do you know anyone in China? Then you're going to have to get to know someone in China or, or work out work out where those resources are coming from, right? So, so China is where it's going to be cheapest to make, but it's cheap to make in China when you want 100,000 of something. 
Um, now, if you only want 20 of something, it might be cheaper to make it down the road because you don't need to make all those relationships, you don't have all the shipping, you don't have to you know, go through the design iterations because chances are they'll make 15 prototypes and they'll all be wrong and you'll have to go to the factory and you'll change factory process and things like that. So um, the actual resources at your disposal in terms of manufacture, very important. How many engineers have you got? One, two, three, four. Yeah. You don't have any in your group? Um, who's paying their bills? How much are these people willing to pay? So if they're only willing to pay this much and that's going to pay your salary, then obviously you can't assume that everyone else is going to be working on the project. So resources. Um, I talked a little bit, points of difference and distinction or originality. You don't just redesign something for shits and giggles. You do it for a purpose. Uh, in industry, you might be doing it because something broke or because something's old or because something's costly to run. You know, it might be using more power than it needs to. There's got to be a reason for design. You don't just redesign something for fun. You'll never make any money or your company will never make any money and you'll lose your job if you just design stuff just for fun. Um, aside from in your garage, feel free to design stuff for fun in your garage, I guess. But, um, or race cars, but I suppose that kind of has a, has a reason. Uh, time, how long do you have to do this? Uh, people, I said that a little bit, how many people um, in the manufacturing, in the engineering, that sort of thing. Cost, how much does a mountain bike cost? Someone choose a number for what our mountain bike is going to be. So what are we thinking? Are we thinking cheap kids bike or are we thinking fancy? Thousand bucks. Thousand bucks mountain bike. Good. Alright. How much do you reckon that shop buys it from the wholesaler for? Conservatively. 400 bucks maybe? Yep. How much do you reckon the wholesaler buys it from the distributor for? 200. 200? Yeah, that's a conservative figure. It might be less or more, but 200. How much do you reckon the distributor buys it from the Chinese manufacturers for? 50 bucks. 50 bucks. 50 bucks is probably more than they do, but 50 bucks. Let's say 50 bucks with shipping and so forth. Alright, we've just got a thousand dollar mountain bike that's got to compete on the open market and we have to make it for 50 bucks. That's where we just got with that, right? So, how much is raw material? That's four hundred dollars if you're building a fucking nice um, So, you need to find a source of cheap raw material, you need to minimise your expenses in manufacture, you need to get as many off-the-shelf cheap components as you can and this has just put a nice big wall around our design process. Yeah? Everything now has to live inside that $50. Or you say, not possible, and walk away. Yeah? So cost isn't just, I've got this pretty design, alright, how much am I going to build it for? Cost is everything, in almost every circumstance. And so you've got to start from at least being eyes wide open about cost in design. Uh, weight, how much is it going to weigh? How much does a weight, mountain bike weigh? Hopefully not much. I should be able to pick it up. Everyone in this room should be able to pick it up, ideally. Um, so it can't weigh much. Can we make it out of cast iron? Can we make it out of steel? Yeah. If, it's a, if it's a cheaper one, yeah, probably. Uh, can we make it out of aluminium? Your costs are starting to go up. Are we making it out of carbon fibre? Not for our $50 price point. So that's, you know, weight, weight is a consideration. Uh, service life, how long does a mountain bike last? Yeah, definitely you'd hope. I mean, in the context of what we're designing, we design things for infinite life, right? And so things should last forever. But then you get a salty environment and things rust or someone drops it off a mountain onto a rock or something like that and it's going to break. But ideally it breaks because someone else does something wrong rather than the engineering is wrong. So from an engineering standpoint we design it for infinite life. From a serviceability, probably 10 years or something like that it would be reasonable for a mountain bike. If I had a mountain bike, certainly I've forgotten where I bought it so they can't come back and sue me. So that's, that's probably good enough. Um, Manufacturing, we talked about how we're going to make it. Maintenance, maintenance is very important. Bikes get maintained, certainly some bikes. Replace bearings, replace shafts, replace wheels, things like that. So the design process has to allow for that. Um, decommissioning, becoming much more important these days. What do I mean by decommissioning? And the lifestyle. 
Like, yeah. You know, it gets pulled apart and you can recycle. Yeah, so can you recycle everything? Are there nasty chemicals somewhere in it that you need to do something with? Because that's your responsibility. It is now your responsibility as an engineer to make sure that whatever goes into it comes out of it safely at the end. It's part of the sustainability of everything that we design. So you need to think about end of life. For a mountain bike, how do we dispose of a mountain bike? Does anyone ever dispose of a mountain bike other than getting one stolen? Yeah, you might just accidentally leave it on the bike rack somewhere. That's not a very sustainable way of doing it. It's, 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 not, it's not uncommon. Um, you might sell it. You might. It might just go to the dump. It might rust and be left on a mountain somewhere. There's there's all sorts of different. So let's say someone leaves is irresponsible and leaves their bike on a mountain. That thing now rusts and leaches all its chemicals into the environment, and kills a bunch of animals or something like that. That's bad. So you need to anticipate that someone's going to do the wrong thing and make sure that your design allows for no you know, negative consequence of that. Alright, restraints. Do we have seatbelts on um, cars? Uh, bikes? No. no? Uh, I think restraints more means like limitation restrictions in terms of you know, legislation. There's probably some laws that you need to adhere to with bikes in terms of you know safety and that sort of thing. Um, and there might be standards involved as well, and so we need to recognise that. All of that has to happen right at the very beginning. All right, so this is a much more specific way of looking at defining that problem than you will have dealt with in the past, but this is what you need to do in the design process. Conceptual design. All right, so this is some research and brainstorming and things like that. So, our mountain bike, is it going to have suspension? Yeah? Yeah, all right, so what sort of mountain biking are we doing? Cross country, downhill, riding around the city, just getting to work. Sort of depends on that, yeah? So it will have been defined at some point. But let's say that we're going downhill and we want front and rear suspension. So our costs, you know, we're building a very cheap bicycle at, you know, $1,000 for that. Question? On the nails. Um, so that's all part of, our, part of our design. What bicycles have come before it? So we will have lots of research and images and everyone else in the marketplace and obviously we're not going to rip off their design. If anything we've got to make sure that we're not doing what they've done because if we put out something that looks like someone else's we'll get sued. Um, but you need to be across the way things have been done in the past so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel fundamentally. Um, so you can do sketching and all sorts of things. Loading. We're going to do a lot of that in this subject. What loads are on this bike? So, what's the worst thing that will happen to a mountain bike, load-wise? Not counting getting hit by a car. So, going over something, maybe getting some air. If this is a downhill, we've got suspension. Uh, what's the biggest thing you might jump off on a mountain bike? Bowler, say, metre and a half, two metres. Alright. How much does a average person that we're happy to ride on this bike weigh? 80 kilos. Um, I would suggest that we put a factor of safety on that of probably double. So let's say 150 kilo person is riding this bike. They've come at 50k an hour and they've just done a drop of 2 metres on this bike. What's their acceleration through the air? 9.81 plus all of the things you learn in pH 1.005 gives you a velocity when they hit the ground and an impulse load when they hit the ground. And where does that load get applied on the bike? Well, suspension, but where does the person apply it for starters? Pedal. Either seat or pedals. If you've just done a two metre drop off and you're sitting on the seat, you're having a bad <laughs> <laughs> So probably you're standing relatively evenly on the pedals. So you've got this guy's 150 kilo evenly between this pedal and this pedal. So firstly you've got a shaft in the centre that's just had these ones on it. And then the whole thing has had to carry through that triangular frame. It's had to carry through the suspension. The wheels have had to withstand that. And that's one type of loading. All right, what's another type of loading that we might do for a bike? Hitting a tree root or something? Hitting a tree root, yeah. So maybe an impulse load sort of on the front wheel, so you're going to bend the forks back like this and you'd have to work out what that load is and make sure that the forks could, could cope with that. Um, 
maybe even just acceleration, because we're talking about single impact load, so that's like a large static failure, but we'll also talk in this subject about dynamic failure, so fatigue, so repeat loading. So it might be that you can deal with hitting a root, but it's the, the acceleration every single time pushing down on that shaft and the shaft rotating under the weight of the person throughout the entire life of the bike that could cause the failure. So that's a load case that we need to take into consideration. So a lot of what this analysis is, is you working out every single possible load that might be, you know, that the bike might be exerted to, and then we need to analyse for each of those. Right? Same thing as a Tacoma Narrow. So that was a loading that they didn't anticipate and it failed. All right, so we need to anticipate every type of loading and go through the load cases. We'll talk a little bit about that more. We'll talk a lot about that in the subject. You'll need to do that for the shaft you find. You will need to do that for the weld that you find and analyse, the real ones. Okay, So um, we need to think a little bit about loading. Talked a bit about materials. This is where you start choosing materials and kind of feeds into. Um, operating life, user behaviour, patents. Has anyone patented a mountain bike? Because if they have, you bone, you can't build one. Um, but chances are they'll patent specific things on mountain bikes. So Shimano probably has heaps of patterns around gearing and things like that, and you probably can't do the same thing as them. Or you just buy their off-the-shelf gear uh, to save you the, the design time. All right, preliminary design. That part there is where we sit in this subject. All right, but we'll talk a little bit about the other bits. Um, so. Preliminary design is we've got those sketches and now we're actually going to evolve them. We've worked out what the loads are, we've worked out roughly what the shape is. Let's go through and work out whether what we've built will last. The first thing you might actually do is think about a component breakdown. So what are all the individual components that need to be analysed or designed or sourced? And off the shelf, so what might we get off the shelf for this bike? Do you feel like going into the bearing design business? You reckon SKF have something for a lot cheaper than you can design? Bearings. Let's get the bearings off the shelf. What about brakes? Yeah, we could probably get brakes for, let's say, if we're buying heaps of them, I don't know, five bucks. Five bucks for all of the brake systems and leads and everything on the, on the bike if it's a $50 bike. Um, otherwise, you might spend you know, a year designing brakes. People have done that, it's off the shelf. We're trying to cut costs here, so we buy it off the shelf. Uh, what about um, sprockets? Yeah, maybe. Maybe we buy them, maybe we make them. Maybe this is one of the questions that we have in our design process in the preliminary design. Do a preliminary design of them, work out what it's going to cost to manufacture them, put that side by side with the off the shelf version of it, work out which one's cheaper. Okay? Shock absorbers? Springs, for a thousand bucks, probably off the shelf, yeah? Uh, for five thousand bucks, we might, you know, make them ourselves because, you know, the consumer wants something a little bit more custom and, and so forth, but for, for a thousand bucks, you're going to get the cheapest ones you possibly can get. So, you need to go through and work out what you don't need to design, because that's going to define the holes that you put in. If you get an off-the-shelf shock, it's this big, and so that means the suspension has to accommodate that. The brake lines and the brakes, you need to accommodate that and where they pick up on your design. So basically you take all those off-the-shelf things, put them in space, and then you, you know, connect the dots. All right? And that's where your design lives. So it's no good just starting to design something and not think about all of those things. It's very important. Um, working out the manufacturing methods is important because that will define how complex you can go with the geometry. Are you casting it? Are you welding it? Are you doing all of that sort of stuff? Uh, what materials you're making out of, we talked about, and then we're here. All right. And this analysis is what we're going to do in this subject. All right. um, this analysis is what you do in every single design process. This is, you work out the exact loads, free body diagram, shear force diagram, bending moment diagram, torque diagram. Familiar to everyone? Is everyone super comfortable with doing those? Cool, I'm going to spend the next week reteaching and then we'll be good. Um, calculate stress, deflection and critical zones. So is everyone good at least calculating critical element stress or has heard of the idea of calculating a critical element stress? Yes? Good. Um, again, like I said, the next four weeks you will do a crash course in CS2001 to the point where I want you to be for this subject. So I will reteach everything and hopefully you'll, you'll be okay. Most of it you should have. If you're super across it and familiar, then it'll just be completely reviewed. If there was something that you missed, 
uh, then it will get you up to speed. But uh, you cannot do this subject without things like shear force, bending moment and torque diagrams, uh, critical elements, um, standard fundamental mechanics, that sort of stuff. Okay? Then, once we have critical zone stress and we might have multiple places where we have a candidate for where it might fail, that's when we work out is it going to fail based on criterion, failure criterion that I'm going to teach you. Uh, and then we're going to conclude and either say yes it's sweet or it's got too much material or you know etc etc we need to iterate in the design process. Alright, so this is the fundamental hand calculations. You might do some more complex numerical stuff. Um, and you also might verify against any empirical and published equivalents. So empirical is any type of equations or data sets or something that they have. Um, that you can find in a library or online or something like that that says, you know, this is the amount of force on a mountain bike, this is you know, how much stress it should result in, or something like that. Okay? Uh, and then we refine. So, looking at the stages, we're sort of at that third stage down. Um, oh, yeah, and we use factors of safety. Everyone's good with factors of safety these days. You've done that lots, yeah? Good. So, a factor of safety of two means that. It's a factor of safety to me. If it had a like before with the way a person normally would be like eighty kilos of factor of safety to you need to like make it so they can stand something that's twice the size of them. Exactly. So a factor of safety two is basically twice as strong as it needs to be. Um, factor of safety of one means it's exactly how strong it needs to be and any more force or any more weight or something like that fails. Alright, so our factors of safety, generally speaking as engineers, a factor of safety of two is about a benchmark, um, but there's lots of different sort of areas that you might be. So I've got some examples here. Commercial aircraft, factor of safety of 1.2 to 1.5. Are you comfortable with your commercial aircraft having a factor of safety of 1.2? Why do you think a commercial aircraft, as in one that you put people in, uh, is, has a factor of safety of 1.2? Cost a lot to run and buy. The uh, factor of safety of two is going to make your plane ticket twice as expensive. So that's the first reason. What's the second reason? Do you have any idea how much analysis goes into that plane? So the more analysis you do, the more testing, the more experimental tests and prototypes, the more confident you are in a design, the lower your factor of safety can be. All right, so the fact that they've spent probably 20 years designing that plane and analysing every little piece of it to absolute death and built hundreds of prototypes or at least, you know, prototypes of small components of and then a couple of larger prototypes, the fact that they've done so much analysis means that that 1.2 is, they are really, really confident in that design. Okay, so you can buy yourself a lower factor of safety with more analysis. Uh, military aircraft, 1.1. Why would that be lower? Possibly more analysis. Yeah, they definitely need to do a lot on that. What else? Maintenance schedules. They have lifetime components and things that get replaced. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're very strict with the maintenance schedules. What else? How many people are in it? One. They have an ejector seat. Hopefully. So if things go pear-shaped, they can probably still get out. So you can, you can buy yourself a bit of room there. Also, um, the fact that it's a military aircraft, you want that to have just the absolute peak performance of what it's capable of. So you don't want to be having a factor of safety or two on that because it won't be turning corners and chasing things and all that sort of garbage. Um, missiles, less than or equal to one. What happens if a missile goes wrong? Yeah, well, hopefully it just falls in the water rather than exploding in the wrong house. But um, fundamentally, it's something that's actually designed to get destroyed. So if it kind of, you know, one of the wings falls off it or something like that, it's not the end of the world. So long as you've got the fail safes there, to make sure that it only explodes on target, that sort of thing. Otherwise, it just falls out of the sky. So if it's something that's actually expendable, then it's not the end of the world, then it's, it's got a small factor of safety. All right, detailed design. That's kind of the final bit, right? So that's, that's you've, you've come up with a design, you're really confident that it's going to do what it says. Now you're actually doing some of that extra stuff that maybe buys you a lower factor of safety that makes sure this thing's going to last. If you're building 10,000 of these bikes, you don't want them to start breaking in six months because you're going to have to buy every single one of them back. That's a big problem. 
Um, so if you're talking about something like cars, it takes about 10 years to go from blank sheet of paper to consumer drives the car away. 10 years of analysis. Um, you know, probably five years would be the conceptual and preliminary design phase and then a couple of years of full-on detailed design and analysis and a few years of prototyping, crash testing and things like that. I like using the example of um, the Holden Commodore mainly because I heard about it and blew my mind. Um, the, not the last one they designed in Australia, but the one before that, they built, I think it was a hundred prototypes of that car and that was largely by hand, manufacture, and they were about two million bucks each. And that's what they used to crash into walls and drive around on bumpy roads and make sure the thing actually lasts, such that they can then sell them, you know, tens of thousands of them to consumers and be confident that they're going to last 15 or 20 years. So think about the sheer amount of money required to make sure that that design makes it all the way to, to its lifetime. All right. Now, 100 cars, if you think about it, isn't that many crashes. And it's not that many driving around in circles. So you have to complement that with things like finite element analysis, which you do in this detailed design phase like this. You might do a thousand different finite element models and then one car. And if that car crashes and crumples and breaks in the same way of all your models, it verifies all of that numerical work that you did. All right, so you do the numerical because you can do lots of it cheap. And then you do the real one to make sure the numerical is not garbage. All right. And so that's sort of where this phase gets into it. Uh, and as I said, prototyping experiments, that kind of stuff. What sort of test might we want to do on our mountain bike? Continue loading on the seat, just up and down like someone's sitting on. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So some fatigue loading on the seat would be good. Uh, what else? Constant pedaling. Yep, constant pedaling, that'd be really good. Um, what else? Yep, shock absorbers up and down and up and down and up and down. Maybe the whole bike over like a bumpy conveyor belt or something like that and, and do that to, that to shake it to bits. Maybe try and shake all the nuts off it. Work out that you need a, a better nylock nut than what you had on there or something like that. Yeah, so there's lots of tests we can do to this bike to make sure that it works. Even down to, this is a simple one, you've just got the frame here and they're just putting a load down in the centre, so flexing it where the actual person's going to be flexing over bumps. So just a really simple bench test, but you can put lots of those on there and work out whether the frame's actually going to hold the weight. And You can put strain gauges all over it and work out, you know, if you had a numerical model and worked out the strain, for a particular force and you have strain gauges on the experiment, you're now verifying your numerical model while, by doing a bench test, which is very, very effective. And that's what you do in this phase. Design communication. Who are we communicating our bicycle to? Investors. Investors, yes. Yeah, so the investors and the person who brought it to you needs to actually see the design that you've, you've produced. Who else? Manufacturers. Manufacturers, definitely. So if you're getting a made in China or down the road or wherever, you need to be able to communicate that to them in a way that they can very efficiently manufacture your stuff. And so that communication might be 2D drawings. If it's manufacturers, you probably want all your CAD um, or your, you know, your solid models so that they can put them into their CNCs and all the rest of it as well. But that's a, you know, something you work out ahead of time. Who else? Bike mechanics. Bike mechanics, yeah. So service manuals, that's a good one. Alright, so if you've designed this thing, you don't just hand it off, you need to actually stipulate how it's serviced, how you open it up, how you change your bearing, how you do all that sort of stuff. Anyone else? You probably need a proper engineering document. So you have the design document to investors and uh, the you know person who got you to build the bike and things like that that is the, the pretty, this is our bike that we've designed. You also have a very concise, maybe three or four page engineering document with a proper signature of a certified practicing engineer on it that says this thing will last, it is safe. Because that's what the person came to you, actually came to you for as an engineer. That signature, and they will look at probably the executive summary and stick it in a drawer. And the only time they get it out of the drawer is when the bike breaks and they get sued or hurt someone, and then they're coming straight for you. Right, so that's why we do our due diligence, that's why we do our 10 different methods of analysing, that's why we do all of those experiments. Because when we sign one of those documents, we need to be confident that our life is on the line with that document that we're handing over. Because it fundamentally is, if you get sued, and, you, know, you, know, you don't have a job anymore and potentially your life is going to change very rapidly if you're getting sued for a lot of money. 
So we don't sign carelessly. It's not just you, your signature is out there in the world and it's dangerous. You do all of your engineering and you're confident and the six other engineers that have seen it are confident. You've put all of that work into practice and now you actually are completely confident in your life being safe with your signature on the page. All right? And you don't do that until you're actually certified. So you graduate and then you have maybe five to seven years, maybe less, um, actually working under certified engineers before you get that RPN status or whatever you want to be. Okay, so that's that's your on-the-job training from then on, and you have to tick all of these boxes to get there. Cool? All right, and then we have a bike. All right. Um, and hopefully it sells, and you, know, you, you, you basically made a lot of money for your client. Fundamentally, it doesn't really matter if it sells or not, because you made your money designing it. You won't probably make any money from the ones that they actually sell. So um, you just will have a happy or angry client based on that. But otherwise... We've got there. So that's that's a little bit more detailed version of the design process. And I wanted to go through that to give you context for the analysis that we will be doing and we'll be talking about. And effectively everything you do for the next, well, this and two more subjects in this design stream is learning these things. Alright, so this is the fundamentals, this is the hand calculations, you'll do some Australian standards. You'll do FEA in EG3001, which will be sort of the next level, that more detailed design phase, and you use that when you have much more complex geometries. Uh, and then in the ME3525, you kind of put it all together. So you do the full design process with all of these stages of research and investigation and the analysis and the prototyping and all of that sort of stuff all together in ME3525, and we'll, we'll get to the end there. So this is sort of the, the beginning of that journey. Okay. Uh, let's have a five minute break and then we're going to start talking a little bit about forces and we'll start doing CS2001 recap stuff. Mm -hmm. Alright, so, cool. right. so what we are going to do, as I've been saying, is we're going to go through uh, some of the stuff you did in CS2001, the important stuff that I need you to know. The first thing that I need you to know is um, I need you to actually understand shear force diagram, bending moment diagram, torque diagram, axial force diagram, that kind of stuff. All right? These are very important for calculating critical stresses um, and I can't speak for Toe because I haven't had anyone that's done his subject before, but I know in previous years under different lecturers, uh, people have come out of CS2001 not really understanding the stuff that they need to understand. So I have always done this kind of review to get you up to speed with what I want you to know. Um, does anyone understand what a shear force diagram actually is? Can anyone explain to me? represents the amount the force that's trying to shear the yeah. path into at any given point in the water. Yeah, absolutely. So are we talking external forces, internal forces, or both? Internal. Internal, internal yeah. So internal only. Uh, it's as a result of external forces. But that diagram is effectively what the force is everywhere. All right? And that's important because what we want to know is what the stress is everywhere. So that's, that's why we do it. Um, so it seems like you guys pretty much have a, have a grasp for it. So I'll go through these relatively quickly and just highlight a couple of points. Um, positive sign convention. Have you guys seen that? Yep. Are the arrows all in that direction in the version that you've seen? Yep. Good. Write this on almost the top of every page that you use in the next couple of weeks because it is very important and the way that this actually works with all of our shear force diagrams, etc., is quite important. I've added torque here. I don't know if you've had torque in the past, but this is a double-headed arrow means torque. So basically, torque, right hand rule. We always use the right hand rule. So your thumb goes in the direction of the arrows, and that's the direction of rotation. Okay. So right hand rule, point your thumb in the direction of the double-headed arrow, and that will tell you what the rotation is for torque. So, torque going out is positive, torque going in is negative. Uh, it's an arbitrary selection. It doesn't really matter with torque diagrams, but I use them anyway. 
because if you've got talk in only one section, it's very helpful to kind of highlight to you that you only have torsional stress as a result of them, only in that section. Uh, well, we'll get to that, so don't worry about that too much. All right, so everyone written that down. Now, shear is down on the right and up on the left. Moment's always up, axial load's always out. All right, so this example is probably the easiest, well, it's not the easiest example, it's probably the second easiest example you're going to get with an axial load applied here, external, and an axial load, you know, counterbalancing that in the center of that member. So, obviously, to the left half of that member, we've got axial load. To the right half of that member, we have no load at all. Everyone good with that? Yep, simple. All right, and so you guys will uh, know that if we did an axial force diagram, has everyone seen axial force diagrams? It's just the same as everything else. You can just have a diagram for every type of force loading that you have throughout a cross section. So that matter. The way that we actually define the line is as a direct result of only the internal load. So that's external loads are meaningless on the diagram. They don't get a dot point on the diagram at all. What they get is you calculate what the internal load as a result of it is that is a data point that you plot on the diagram. All right? And effectively what we're doing here is working out this face. If I was to take a section and look at all of the atoms throughout that face, what is happening to those atoms? What load is on those atoms? Because that's important because the load that's distributed on those atoms is actually the stress. The stress is just load over area and when it gets down to the atomic level, an atomic bond has a certain amount of area, there's a certain amount of force that's going to pull those atoms apart. Right? That's all stress is. So stress is force over area, and we know that there's a certain amount of stress that will pull those bonds apart, and stress less than that won't. All right? And so that's how we relate force to, to failure. And it's all based on, everything in life is based on atoms. It's all just atoms reacting. So if I was to take this member, and I was to take a cross section here, just look through here, cut it, and then I did my free body diagram of that. Everyone knows what a free body diagram is, I hope. What's a free body diagram? What are the two characteristics of a free body diagram? One, it's not attached to anything. Free body diagram. All right, so if you draw a free body diagram and you have a little wall logo on the left hand side of it, that is not a free body diagram. A free body diagram, I say this because this is what I see in tutorials and quizzes in this subject, so I'm making sure everyone's up to speed with it. Free body diagram is free. It's free in space. It's not attached to anything. What's the second characteristic of a free body diagram? Static equilibrium. Thing not moving. Is that, if I was to draw this, is this attached to anything? No. Is it moving? Or is it about to start moving? Is that force balanced with anything? Not yet. So it's moving or it's about to start moving. So that is not a free body diagram. If you draw a free body diagram, you need to make sure that you are static across all six degrees of freedom. So that's translation in the X, Y, and Z, and that's rotation around X, Y, and Z. All right? And so you might have you know, a shaft with a moment this way, that's around this axis, a moment this way, that's around this axis, and a torque this way, that's around that axis. All three of those are your rotational degrees of freedom, and then you might have forces up, out, in, so forth. All right, so you've got six degrees of freedom in everything that you do, and you need to make sure it's not moving in any of those degrees of freedom. All right, and we'll be dealing with 3D stuff in this subject too, which is stepping away from probably what you've done in CS 2001. So you start to have to visualize three-dimensional space. All right, so that's six degrees of freedom. That's moving. That's now not moving. All right. So we've got a force that way, a force that way. If this force is even to that force, it's not moving this way. Is it moving any other direction? Do we have any rotations? No. Do we have any other translations? No. Easy. Some of the forces in the X gives me that F internal equals P. Easy. I plot that data point. All right. If I went all the way over to one atom's width on the left here, I could still do this force balance and I would still get a data point. All right? And that's what I'm doing. So I'm basically just plotting those data points like so. And the sum of the forces, because you know, that doesn't change, that sum of the forces is um, always going to end up P. Now, I go to the right of that force. I've got a different sum of the forces. 
My sum of the forces now includes the additional applied load. So I've got P to the left, I've got P to the right, plus my extra little force that I add here. I could technically add six different, I could add a you know, uh, potential force up, a potential force out, a potential force in, and a rotation, rotation, rotation. It's just the sum of all six degrees of freedom equals zero, other than this one, and my F internal once they balance out is zero. Yeah, so I'm still doing a force balance, I just know that the force balance is zero. Really fundamentally easy stuff. And that's it. And I like put a positive and a bit of shading or something on it. It just it just makes it stand out and it makes it clear that you understand it's positive and negative and that kind of stuff. Now, see right down here? Dot dot dot. This line doesn't go down, really. Unless this is applied over, you know, some finite width. You know, it starts being applied, ends being applied, then you're going to have a gradient down there. But fundamentally, if that's applied over an infinitesimally small point, it doesn't feature on this curve. That line down there isn't this. This isn't even on the curve. That's an external force. It doesn't get put on this graph. So effectively, you just have a straight line and then free fall and more straight line. Okay, that's important when we get to the shear force diagram stuff that I'll talk about now. Um, oh, and obviously when we were doing this, when we look at that force and I calculate the force, and it, well, not on that one, that's zero obviously, but when I calculate that force, I've drawn it that way and I get a positive, that means I've drawn it in the right direction. And if I've drawn it in the right direction and I look at my P out on the right hand face, that says that that's positive. If this force was pointed in, obviously that would be a thing. Right, really fundamental. Hopefully everyone's getting annoyed with how simple this is. Alright, example two. Beam under bending, yeah? Now this beam under bending, we have a force in the center and our reactions are just half that force. Very simple, everyone should be able to draw the shear force diagram and the bending moment diagram. Um, there's a couple of points that I'm going to make. If everyone, if I was to draw a shear force diagram here, would you guys use those forces and go force goes up, force goes down, force goes up? Is that the technique that you've learned? Okay. That works, but it's wrong. Okay? So, theoretically, if you go left to right, that works. So, if we go left to right, let's have a look at our shear force diagram. Let's go left to right, force goes up, force goes down, force goes up. Positive. Negative, yeah? And that's F12, negative F12. If I go right to left, force goes up, force goes down, force goes up. They're different. That's inconsistent. That's not right. They should be the same. Okay? So, the technique that you've learned or that is easy to actually draw these with works if you go left to right most of the time but if you have something in three dimensional space and you have to determine which left to right and right to left you know it's in 3D space so there's no such thing as left to right anymore you just have to define that now half the time you'll choose the wrong thing and you'll have it backwards okay? so you need a technique that actually gets it right every time not just convenient. All right, so um, that's largely why I'm focusing on this today, so that I can show you where this diagram actually comes from. And it doesn't come from force goes up, force goes down. It comes from the internal forces. Force goes up, force goes down is easy to calculate. So you can you can do that and then verify your number with a couple of simple calculations. All right, so same thing. We chop a little section here. We've got a little bit more complex force balance to work out and then two points on two curves to add rather than one point on one curve. So this is probably, hopefully, what you've done before. We look at that front face and we draw our free body diagram. And free body diagram, translation in the X, nothing. Translation in the page, nothing. Translation in the Y, which is up. I should have drawn my axes on this. You should always draw your axes. Uh, translation in the up-down version. F12 up, so we need something stopping it going up, so we have our V down. Okay? Alright, so that's now 
Translation, three degrees of freedom, not moving. Now, if I didn't have that moment there, I've got up on the left, down on the right, and this thing's spinning in space. <coughs> so obviously we need to stop it spinning. The thing that stops it spinning is all of those atoms on the front face under bending. It holds it there, it stops it spinning. There's nothing on the left hand end because that's a pin. Right? So that nothing's stopping it spinning there. But on that right hand face it's the other atoms that stop it through bending. So that's why we put the moment there. And right hand rule, it's spinning into the page. So we need a moment opposite to that. Right? And so I've drawn them in the direction that I know they are. If you draw them backwards, you'll just get a negative number in the force balance and you know that it needs to be drawn in the opposite direction. Everyone good with that? Yeah, free body diagram 101. Cool. So, now what we need to work out is our points on the curve. And we need to do that through our, some of the forces, some of the moments. So, some of the forces in the Y uh, gives us that V internal is F12, just F12 minus V internal, so that's simple. F12 is a positive, so I've drawn it in the correct direction. If this came out negative, it just means I've drawn it backwards and I draw it the other way. Now what I do is I look at the direction of my vector as drawn in the positive direction for the force balance. It's down. Look at my positive sign convention. Is it positive or negative? Positive. That's a positive point on the curve. Okay, that's probably the point that you haven't got fully 100% um, confident with. That this is positive here, so that's why it's a positive here. Not because this force is up. It's got nothing to do with that force being up and everything to do with what the actual sign of the shear of the internal loads is. Okay, and that internal load is positive. There you go. Positive point on the curve. Positive point on the curve whatever V value is, which is F12. Okay, now we calculate our bending moment. Bending moment, I've drawn it correctly, uh, but if I hadn't, it would come out as negative. Moment is just right hand rule around, let's say, north, the centre point. So moment, that's a positive, so M internal, and we've got this V going down, which is a negative times the X, so minus X times V internal. Uh, and obviously F on 2 doesn't have a lever arm, so it doesn't feature. Rearrange, and I have my moment equals X times V internal. We've got an equation for V internal, which is F on 2. So my point on the moment curve is, or the, the magnitude of the point on my moment curve is X times F on 2. Is my moment, because I've got a positive, my moment is drawn in the correct direction. Is it positive or negative on the positive sign convention? Positive. So that's why it's a positive point on the actual bending moment curve. Okay? So that's a positive point there. And this is actually an equation to the entire curve from here to here as x increases. Uh, so if x was 0, obviously that's 0. If x is L on 2, then that's going to be what? Uh, FL on 4. Okay, so that's the equation to the first part. And that's exactly what we've got here. So that's what happens until we get to that load. And remember, that load doesn't feature on these curves, it just changes what happens internally. All right, so we don't have line goes down, we just have dot, 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 dot. Same here, dot, dot, dot. It's just, just that that line is above the curve or not. All right, we get over to the right there. Now we need to redo that force balance. Forgetting about all of this for a second, I've got half F up, Full F down, is this moving up or down? Yeah, yeah, I've got half F worth pushing it down. Alright, so that means I need something pushing it back up again to stop that translation, and we know just based on our brains that that's going to be F12, but we'll calculate it as some of the forces in a second, anyways. Now, is it rotating this way or that way with those forces on it? What do you reckon? So around this point, so that doesn't feature, I have F and an F on 2. Which one's going to be moving it more? The F. The F, yeah. And the only time that changes is because F on 2 is multiplied by this and F is multiplied by that. When this F on 2 gets all the way out here, F on 2 times 2L, F times L on 2 is the same. 
Uh, that's the only point where that switches over. I mean, it technically just hits zero, and that's why our moment curve hits zero. But anyway, when it's somewhere in the middle here, we know we're pretty confident we can do the sum of the moments anyway that it's rotating this way unless we put something up this way. All right? Doesn't matter. If you get wrong, you'll just get a negative on the sum of the moments, and it will tell you that you're wrong. That's the fun thing about maths. So, we've calculated V internal. Some of the moments is now has this extra F, and I've just put an L on two there. You could just put a different variable in there. Bup, 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 rearrange, and we get moment is FL on two minus XF on two. And that's a positive if you look at that equation for any time that X is less than L. And the only time that X is equal to L is over here on the right. And if X equals L, this equals zero. Yeah? Um, and the other thing is, we know that that's positive, and so we've drawn it correctly. This will be a negative if you've drawn it backwards, so you just know to flip it. Look at that. Is that positive or negative on our positive sign convention? Negative. Negative? Why? Sorry. Moment? Moment. The moment as drawn, is this positive or negative on our positive? Positive. Positive. That's why it's still positive. So it's still positive, it's just positive by a bit less because we know this peak here is you know, whatever it is, so it's come down a little bit. And so we can do that all the way to the right hand section there. All right, so it's, it's more effort, and I'm not saying that you need to do this every time. So force goes up, force goes down is fine, and then you can calculate your moment, you change your moment based on area under that curve, if that's the way that you've learnt. It's correct but you need to verify that you've gone the right way with all your positives and negatives because I will mark you down if they're wrong. Okay? And they will dictate uh, the way that your force vectors go in your infinitesimal elements. And if you get that wrong, then you might have two vectors adding where they should be subtracting or vice versa, and it's going to screw your whole calculation. Right, so we need to get this right. All right so I, I suggest you review this. At Tudor on Monday, we'll review this with free body diagrams and a little bit more complex stuff. But, that's where that goes. Um, and oh, yeah, well, I didn't even talk about it. But because that's up, is that positive or negative on the sign convention? Negative. And that's why that point there is negative. Yeah. And that's why that's negative all the way along because the arrows change direction. So if we look over here, arrow goes down, arrow goes up. All right, and then we put our bit of shading and pluses and minuses and so forth if you feel like it. I quite like doing that. All right, now, last thing I wanted to do. I might finish a bit early today, which would be good. Let's... I'll even put this up. You guys on your piece of paper, do exactly the process that I did. Choose, let's say, two points. Choose one point between these two arrows and one point between these two arrows. Plot the value on the curve but go right to left. Okay? Right to left. And so what that means is... And I'll do it on the board in a second, but I want you to actually think about it, so you do it first. Right to left, I want you to... Plot that point. And I want you to... plot that point. And think about your positive sign convention, think about the sum of the forces, and prove to me that you get exactly the same curve going right to left as you do going left to right. Now I've given it away, obviously, but I want you to prove that mathematically. Because remember, the force goes up, force goes down way, we get the opposite shear force diagram. Kind of lay it out the same way that I have. I always lay them out that way. If you draw a free body <laughs> diagram, you should always, always, always draw your shear force diagram and your bending moment diagram laying directly under it and then project everything down. Firstly, it makes sense to me when I look at it. Secondly, it makes your life heaps easier to get these points right. Alright, how are we going? We're completely lost or pretty much got it? Under control? Cool. Alright. This little one, what's the force balance look like on the left hand side of it? <coughs> what do we have? A shear in a moment? Alright, what's the shear do? 
Yeah? So mine would do it. And hopefully you calculate some values, but obviously V is going to be F on 2 and M is going to be whatever that equals, what X times on right. That's X. It's going to be X F on 2. We got. Yeah. Double O. Um, yeah. Uh, no. So, if you've drawn that down and it's down correctly, it's positive if it's drawn down, right? But when you draw it on the curve, it will be a negative. Yeah? So, up is positive, down is negative, that's right. You don't write it negative here, because if I wrote V equals negative F on 2, that would mean this arrow was drawn backwards, yeah, on the diagram. So you, when you calculate some of the forces, you'll get F on 2. It's correct. A positive number is correct as drawn. When you then translate it onto the curve, that's when you look at the sign convention and you say down is negative, that's a negative point of my curve, which is correct because we know that over here on the right, that's negative and that's what we expect. So we get it both ways. Can we just set it up? like the positive sign convention every time and then if it's positive, like if it's easier for us that way. Going left to right. Oh, yeah, e either way, like if I just set up the V pointing up so that I know if I get the positive number, it's going to be positive on my diagram. It's negative. I don't. Say that again. Sorry. So, <laughs> I, I did it so instead of pointing it down, yeah, yeah. I just made it point up because that was my positive sign convention. Yeah, and then, and then you calculated the negative number, number, and then that's number, which, which, which meant yeah, it was a negative number on my five. That's fine, okay. so long as you're cool with that. I'm, I'm, so this this stuff you can do lots of different ways, like exactly that. You can draw it up, you can calculate a negative number, which means it's actually down, which means that that's fine. Um, so long as you're consistent, and when it gets really tricky, you can still apply that without you know, getting stressed about it all or wrong. Um, I don't, with this design stuff, if you guys have a better way than me that you find in a textbook, go nuts. That's great. All right? So I don't mind the process so long as the result is correct and that you understand what you're doing. So this is about building your fundamental skills that you're going to then use in every engineering design subsequent. All right? Those fundamental skills, if you find something that works for you, go nuts, that's great. So long as you get it correct and that you understand why it's correct. Don't just use something that's correct like the up-down method that uh, that's how I learned it and that's how I taught it for years until I worked out what the actual alternative was. Um, you know, that up-down method works but if you don't understand why it works then it's not any help to you as an actual engineering skill. If you understand why it works and when it doesn't work then you can use it. So for this example, left to right if you did one point here and you just confirmed that that was positive and that was going to agree with the up-down method, then the up-down method for 20 more forces works perfectly well and you can use it from then on. Okay? So, so long as you can verify that the method you're using is correct and you understand it, that you know, multiple different ways of analysing something that I was talking about, you can verify that what you've done is correct, then it's correct. And that's as good as I need. That's, that's fine. That's good engineering. All right? So just because I've taught you something doesn't mean you need to use it. It's just I'm teaching you that to understand where things come from. Okay? Um, all right, so this one, up or down, shear. Up, yep. Uh, up or down moment. So that's spinning it that way, so it should be up like that. All right, um, V should be V equals F on 2. M should be, what does M equal? That's, what are we calling that? X and that L on 2. It should be, almost identical to what I had over there. It should be something along the lines of F, L on 2 minus X, F on 2. Is that what you guys got? Yeah. Yep, so it's still positive. Alright, so the point here, shear, we talked about 
the fact that it's down and it's posit up on the positive sign convention, so that's going to plot to a negative point. Great. This one's up. We look at the positive sign convention is up as well, so that's going to plot to a positive point on the shear curve, which is exactly what we got the other way. So that confirms that that's consistent regardless of which direction we go in. Moment, moment, look at a positive sign convention, up, or what are we calling that, clockwise, is positive, so that still plots to a positive point, same as our other curve, perfect. This, up, still plotting to a positive point, same as our other way, perfect. So we're consistent in both directions, which is a really good indication that we're doing the right thing now, okay? Um, the last point before we go, Why the hell do we care? Why the hell do we care that we get this right? Alright? So, uh, you guys will have done little stress elements, uh, and this is why. Alright? So, these curves are not just curves that you draw up for fun and games. These curves are the exact value of force in the cross section of that member for the continuum of that member, for the entire length of that member. I now know what the force is for the entire length, not just one point. I don't need to do my force balance every single time I say, all right, I've got a critical element here, all right, let's do a sum of the forces, sum of the moments. I don't need to do that now. I've got a graph. And that graph tells me consistently throughout the entire continuum what the force is, what the moment is, what the axial force is, what the torque is, everything. And that's really important because what we're going to do in this subject is not just calculate one place for stress, we have to calculate the maximum place for stress. All right, and there might be two or three. If we have a really complicated forces and torques and things like that, there might be a place where you have a big torque and a couple of shears, and a different place where you have a couple of shears and a bending moment. And which one's more critical? I don't know. So that's why you have a couple of candidate places. You work out where the maximum possible candidate is in a couple of different places. You calculate all the stresses. You compare that to a value criteria. You work out which one's the more critical. But to do that, we need to know what the force is everywhere. Right? It's no good just having a couple of points of data. And so this gives us a continuous point of data. Where's our critical point for this particular sharp? Or B in the middle. In the middle. So in the middle, either just to the left of the force or just to the right of the force, but not so far as you go away from that little point there. Okay? So um, I would do probably a critical element just to the left. So let's say an atom width to the left there. Uh, and that's where the critical stress we would calculate. Um, and so that's why we do this, and why I need you to get it right, is that we will actually be drawing vectors on that stress element in a particular direction. And if you have a torque adding to shears, and they add on one side, subtract on the other, and you've got zeros on tops and bottoms, and all sorts of complex stress elements. So you need bending moment stress element, shear stress element, torque stress element, axial force stress element, and all four of those modes might add or subtract on a particular single critical zone, and we need to make sure all of our vectors are in the right direction. All right, so it starts with this, and then we move on. Cool. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Uh, remember, and I'll send out that email, we are in 133 tomorrow, not the silly dry lab. Okay.